I think let's begin. Um, <laughs> 37 and I have I'm at the club my name is Trisha I'm at the club and we have a strict mask rule at the club but there's nobody around anywhere so I'm going to take my mask off <laughs> so you guys can see me and hear me more clearly welcome thank you for joining um again my name is Trisha Maloney and I don't technically work for a Fittler club I work for Michael Foreman he's one of the co-founders of the club and um part of my responsibilities and my work that I do for Michael is that I help him and his family with their art collection and that's how I got involved with Fiddler Club because um Michael's been very involved with the art programming here so um that's why we're I'm here today and I'm you know this is intended to be a, just a fun walkthrough of the field house to give a little bit more background on the art that we did in this space it's funny of all of the different art programs that we have throughout the club, the artist in residence program in offsite, all of the art in the, the main part of the club on the second floor that's on loan from Michael's family's collection. Like of everything, the questions that I, the, what I get asked about the most is the field house art. Um, I think that it resonates with people, it's relatable. Um, so I get asked about it a lot and that was part of what spurred us to do this today. Um, so before we begin talking, uh, before we begin our tour and start talking about the art in the field house, does anybody have any questions about Fiddler Club art program generally? Good. Al? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious um, because I noticed there's a, a mix in the spaces between art that's been loaned to us, art that we purchased, and art that is available to be purchased. I'm just wondering what the thought process is in what, what goes where and what things are loaned, what things are purchased and what things are made available to members in the public to purchase. Yeah, so I'll, um, there's Alyssa. I can break it down pretty simply. So the only art that is on loan to the club that's for sale is inside of the offsite. That's the artist in residence program art. Um, other than that, the, the art that's in the main spaces of the club is on loan from the Foreman family collection. So it's not for sale. When you get into the field house, you have a mixture of some fine art from the Foreman family collection, as well as some Fittler Club permanent collection pieces that the Fittler Club purchased when the club opened or during the, the early days of the club. And I'll speak to some of that as we walk through. But um, I've had several people ask me if they can buy some of the works into the field house. And unfortunately, none of them are for sale from Fiddler Club, but I can help you figure out how to buy it yourself if you are interested in doing that. Okay. All right, so we'll begin our tour. We're actually gonna start slightly outside of the field house. So I'm standing right by the MSA desk. We're walking out into the hallway. Miranda's gonna split the screen and share a PowerPoint. Um, oh, you're, go ahead, Jen, don't worry. Um, and so we're gonna start with these black and white photographs that line the hallway as you enter the club from 24th Street. So these works are, um, here's our PowerPoint, there we go. Um, so these works are part of a series by a photographer named Romeo Aquara. The series is called Rescue Two. Romeo has a really interesting story. He was born in Nigeria. He moved to the States as a child and is a professional football player. So he went to college at Notre Dame, played football at Notre Dame, took up photography as a hobby while studying and playing football for Notre Dame. He graduated from college, started playing in the NFL for the Giants. And during his time with the Giants, he had the opportunity to visit the Rescue Two Firehouse in New York City. It is one of the, one of the, if not the busiest firehouse in Manhattan. And um, he just really clicked with the, the vibe and the culture of the firehouse, became really good friends with the guys and created this series of photographs um, during, oops, um, during time that he spent with them. And in fact, he actually now plays for the Detroit Lions and just anecdotally, like when he goes back to New York to visit, he like lives at the firehouse. Like those are his buddies. Um, and so that was um, where this series of photographs was born. And there are six that line the hallway here. There's another four that are up in offsite. Romeo is one of our artists in residence. So he is one exception to the rule in terms of our artists in residence being inside of offsite. Um, we do have some of Romeo's works down here in the hallway as you enter. Um, so, yeah, that is our 
Um, our first stop, so now I'm gonna head back inside. And feel free to chime in with any questions that you may have as we go. That's part of why Al is with us. You can also enter questions into the chat and Al will read them. Um, so here we are. We are in level zero reception of the club and our next stop is the Glass House. It's photographed by a photographer artist named James Welling. It's taken of the Glass House, which is um, located in New Canaan, Connecticut. It's an architectural masterpiece by an architect named Philip Johnson. Um, very um, groundbreaking architectural work. It's a house made of glass. The architect Philip actually lived in the house from 1949 to 2005. And it's really intended both the, the house itself as well as the art photography of it are just intended to be um, the, the, the marriage of architecture and landscape and how the two can, can coexist. Um, so this is a piece from the Foreman family collection. So moving on, I'm gonna head towards the pool and the locker rooms. Um, so a little bit of background that I didn't give at the beginning in terms of how the concept for Fieldhouse Art came to be. Um, as the club was opening, we were thinking, you know, what can we do that will be interesting and applicable to a gym Fieldhouse environment? And um, we wanted to do field houses because we were going to call it the field house. So we did a series of Philadelphia based field houses or stadiums. So the first one that you see here is um, Franklin Field at University of Pennsylvania. I did a little research on this. Al, I think you might know a little bit about Franklin Field as well, but um, I think it's the oldest active football stadium in the country. Um, so it's been around for a very long time, and this is a vintage photograph of it that we found through either Philadelphia Department of Records or Temple Archives, I'm not sure which one, um, that we had blown up and framed along with the other four on this opposite wall here. Um, so Miranda can click through, you'll be able to see them a little bit better in the chat, the Fieldhouse, um, I'm sorry, the Palestra Basketball Stadium at Penn. Here we have, um, the Tri Stadium. So this is an old photograph of stadiums that I think none of the, the these three stadiums are there any longer. You have Veteran Stadium in the foreground, the Spectrum in the middle, and John F. Kennedy Stadium in the background. Which I, um, John F. Kennedy Stadium was demolished in 1992. I was alive in 1992, but I don't even remember that. Um, and I've lived in Philadelphia my whole life, but it actually has a really interesting background. Um, it was it just in terms of like what's taken place there. I think something like 41 Army Navy games have been played in that stadium. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Judy Garland have all performed there and Live Aid was held in John F. Kennedy Stadium. Um, so I never would have known that. So those are our field houses an homage to Philadelphia stadiums. All right, keeping it moving. I'm gonna come around the corner here. I think we have, do we have the swimming pool next? Yes, in the swimming pool. Um, so one of our themes for what we wanted to do in the field house was to be, it's, it's a, a theme that you see throughout Fiddler Club is, is like whimsy and fun. Um, so instead of doing swimming photographs of like Michael Phelps, something that's so straightforward, we wanted to do something that was a little bit left of center. So um, Amanda Potter, who was a, the architect and designer in the development of Fittler Club found this artist photographer, Maria Swarbova, Swarbova, and all, she has this, it's an enormous series of photographs. They are all taken in old pools in Slovakia. So socialist era pools, and the, the concept for these is like people frozen in motion, and just like the beautiful geometric lines of a swimming pool. Um, so we put these right outside of Fittler Club's equally beautiful swimming pool. Um, so certainly I would recommend checking out Maria's website. Um, there are so many more photographs and just like really interesting stuff. Um, okay, we're heading into the ladies locker room. Um, this is actually a very recent installation. You may have not even seen it, uh, but these are two works from a series of foreign family collection art that is also found in the new private dining room if you haven't been up there 
um, we have a whole wall of these works. They're Ronnie, Ronnie Horn photographs. And I'm actually gonna pull up, cause I wanna make sure I get all of this right. It's kind of dense what I wanna share about her. But um, so Ronnie, Thorne, it, Ronnie Horn is a photographer and she has this 80 piece series of photographs that she took of the River Thames in London. And um, about the series, she says, the river evinces intimacy and fear. It possesses a monumentality without scale and its surface is at once transparent and opaque. I took thousands of images of it and I have come to see it as the ultimate metaphor, a mirror for our rights, wrongs, the surface in which we see ourselves. Um, and then she goes on to say, um, she's been drawn to water for a long time and is a, a subject she returns to again and again exploring its seemingly paradoxical qualities of clarity and reflection. Um, and yeah, so it's meant to be almost like a, um, an autobiography. You can capture so many different moods in the same body of water. And just like we as humans can experience so many different emotions or moods. Um, so that's really kind of like what she's trying to capture. So we have a little taste of this series here in the women's locker room, but I certainly recommend checking out the private dining room where we have a whole wall and um, we actually also have a few in offsite as well. Okay, moving on, we're going to go into the men's locker room and um, a series that we have in here. Gordon Parks is a photographer who took a lot of, um, he was just like a, a very active artist during the civil rights movement in the 1960s. We have a work of his up in um, the bar as well. And um, yes, so he spent some time photographing Muhammad Ali. These photographs were taken, um, the one in the cars from 1960s, yeah, they're both from 1966. This was a time when Muhammad Ali, um, he had just joined the Nation of Islam. He had just changed his name. He was the heavyweight champion of the world. Um, so there was a lot of attention on him at this time, and Gordon Park spent time with him in Miami Beach while he was training for a fight, photographing him, and um, we just felt like it was the perfect thing to have in this sort of little, like, mini man cave that um, the guys have. I question whether or not I should share these because um, I get a little bit upset when I come in this room and I see that the guys have this little nook, and we didn't get one of these next door, um, but... Still, I thought it was worth sharing because they're really great works. Al, what's up with that, bro? I asked the same question because I've never seen where men's and women's bathrooms are built together, that the women always have the lounge. The men never have the lounge. I'm used to that, so I was very surprised to see that. Yeah. So anyway, this is a whole <laughs> I do have a quick question, though. Yeah. Um, is all the artwork in the field house, is it all photography? You know, it's not all photography, but most of it is. And that's not intentional at all. I don't mm. know why it shook out that way. There's one, there's like one work upstairs that's not photography, but yeah, pretty much, pretty much all is. So I'm just, I'm curious about um, some of the selections are like vibrant, colorful pieces. Other ones are like these really interesting contrasting photos in black and white. And what kind of, at your role as a curator, like how do you think about those things? And I've seen you painstakingly place things and figure out, oh, this should go here. And then, oh no, I don't want that there. We're gonna put that over here. Uh, what goes on in your thought process about where to place art and why a particular piece of art works in a space versus another space? So it's such a good question. And there's a piece upstairs when we get to it, I'll point it out that I think is the inspiration for everything that we did in the field house and the, but I can speak to it now. And that inspiration was sports, but not sports. Like we didn't want pictures of Michael Jordan and Venus Williams and like, like just straightforward sports. We wanted to do sports related things that had whimsy and were left of center. So it's not Muhammad Ali in a, in a boxing ring. It's him in his car. Um, like, like that was really the main theme. We've sprinkled in some other things since then, but when we first set out, um, like, like the Foreman family collection works that you hear me reference were things that we sprinkled in where we had space. 
but the things that were intended to be field house art were that left of center, like we didn't do, like I said, Michael Phelps swimming with his eight Olympic gold medals around his neck. We did a photographer from Slo Slovakia who photographs people in socialist era pools. So like, like that was kind of like the, the motivation there. Um, just like a wink, sort of like a winking at the audience. Does that make sense? Um, and there's, like I said, there's a, what, the one piece upstairs that was the motivation for all of it, which I think is just like the piece de resistance. Um, okay, so we will head upstairs with that. So next, what do we have next, Miranda? Is it Zoe? Zoe, okay. Um, so I love this little nook. This didn't exist when we installed the art, but we have the sofa here now. It's such a cozy spot. Um, and you know, something about the field house that I don't know if people do this or maybe if they will once we're back in the club, but like just because we're in the field house right now, it doesn't mean that you couldn't come here. You're a member of the club, like you can come here any time of day and sit in this great spot and like do work or read. Um, it's just a, a beautiful space. So this Zoe Leonard series, Zoe Leonard is a photographer and all of these photos were taken of storefronts on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the 1990s as that neighborhood was gentrifying rapidly. Um, so all of these stores were going out of business. And she wanted to, it was just a moment in time that she wanted to capture um, for the people who were getting priced out of their neighborhood. Um, you know, something that happens in cities all over. And um, so that is her, the series is called Selection from the Analog Portfolio. They are dye transfer prints. Sorry, Leonard. Um, and then I think we go over to, yes. So this is um, one that is not photography. This is a work by an artist named Mikhail, per Mikhail Pergelis. It's called Single Cut. And let's see how you can see it. Um, over by the elevators. And so what this artist does is he combs airplane graveyards in California and Arizona to find wreckage. De detritus, I guess is what it's called. I, I've never heard that word before, but, but wreckage from um, airplanes that are, you know, no longer in use. And he turns them into art. He really does very little to them, but he um, creates sculpture out of these works using um, welding, different welding techniques. Um, in, in certain cases, you can actually tell what the airplane may have been before. So this certainly looks, I think, I don't know if anybody else has any guesses, but it looks to me like a FedEx plane, right? Um, yeah, so it's um, found, found objects. It's a, in a form of art and, um, Again, another really interesting artist if you wanna do some reading on your own to learn a little bit more about his process and his background. Um, this, in terms of the installation process for this piece, we really struggled with what could potentially go on this wall because it's kind of dark and everything that we put on that wall, it's also kind of narrow, kind of like it got lost. And I think this work was in storage and I don't know if it was me or Michael said, you know, it would be perfect there. And I think it, ha it is, I get a lot of great feedback on it. I think it works out really well there. It kind of holds the wall. Um, so next we have Ashley Gilbertson, this series, it is called Find Your Line. Um, it continues over by the turf. And um, I think I, uh, oh, thanks Al. And I think Miranda was gonna put um, a link to an article so Ash Gilberson was, is, was featured in an article in the New York Times, and all of these photographs are from that article. He is known as a war photographer. He spent a lot of time in Iraq and Afghanistan um, doing, you know, like more of a journalistic reporting photography, but he is also a runner. He lives in New York City, and he got involved with this organization, or this, not, it's not an organization, it's a renegade group called the Orchard Street Runners, and what they do is, you know, I think what's cool about them is that they don't denounce the concept of running in a marathon during the daytime with, um, it, you know, that's formal and organized, but they also like this concept of meeting 
at nighttime in Manhattan on Tuesday nights. Um, there is a, a route that is posted on Instagram during the day on Tuesday and the runners all meet and it's a race. Um, it's a race to see who can complete the route faster. There's like no rules. Um, I think find your line is a reference to running like through traffic and just kind of having to commit and be um, fearless. So these photographs aren't all taken in New York City, obviously, but that's the motivation for um, this series of works. Just like really gritty running photographs. And this was exactly like, this particularly Michael, as we said about this project, who was like, I, you know, I wanna find things that show people doing sports and activity, but that aren't straightforward. And a woman that we work with, um, one of Michael's art consultants in Manhattan was like, you know, I have this friend, Ash, and he has this great series of running photos. And um, yeah, I, mean, I think they've worked out really well. They're awesome. So definitely check out the article. All right. We can, we can walk back past the, the rest of that series. Miranda, if you want to go back. Isn't this sad? Not for long, though. We'll be back here soon. So we have all these um, lining this wall here. Okay. So now we're going to go back around the corner. Any questions? Okay. Trisha, I had a question. Yes. So back to the swimmer images, um, those to me almost look like she didn't use like humans. Like it almost looked like tiny little like figurines. I, or something. I think that um, actually the word like alien is used in her, um, like the bio on her website. So that's absolutely intentional. They're definitely real people um, in real pools, but it's just like a photographic technique to sort of capture this, um, dreamlike is one of the references that she uses. Amazing. Um, we have a, I didn't even include this in the PowerPoint, but we have a series of, um, the Women's World Cup. It's hard to believe that was a year ago, um, but it was just timely as we were putting this project together. We said, let's capture it once again, this moment in time that was like, just like a really cool thing for our city. And then here on this wall, we have a series of um, Franklin Field illustrated magazines that we had framed. So some of these magazines go back to, I think as early as like 1930. Um, and so Frank Franklin Field Illustrated is an old school pen magazine that um, promoted football games. So Harvard, Pennsylvania, Army, Pennsylvania um, from, yeah, here we go. Cornell, Pennsylvania, 1930. That's how old this is and we were able to get them for an absolute steal. They were like really, really inexpensive and we have them framed. We just thought it was again, like an, a, a cool nod to the city. Um, okay, so do you, snow. Do you have a screenshot of them for the slideshow or? I, I, you know, I didn't put them in the slideshow but I can definitely send you. Uh, now, where are they exactly? I think I maybe may have seen them. They're across from the nest next to the, um, the ADA bathroom. <laughs> So it's like, as we're walking around the corner okay. there. All right. I hope I'm not making you guys too seasick. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so this is like a, just a really interesting feature. This was um, definitely Amanda Potter's brainchild. She just loved the idea of bringing in some, some Philadelphia history. Um, and again, sort of like that, um, it's not a, a picture of people playing football, but it's a reference to football. Cause right. it's not um, okay, so. How much of the, um how much of the art in the field house is uh, Fiddler purchased versus on loan from the, the Foreman family? The works in the field house that are on loan from Foreman family are the Mikhail Pergelis, the, the, the FedEx airplane, the Zoe Leonard series, and the James Welling photograph of the glass house. Mm. Oh, and the Muhammad Ali photographs, the Gordon Parks, those four. Okay. Um, um, okay, so here we are with, at our snow surfers. So this is, it really is this piece in particular, the, um, the truck that says surf, that was, if I could boil it down to one inspiration for what we did here all together, it would be this, um, this photograph. Amanda Potter found this on 
Instagram and she shared it with us and she said, you know, I think this is kind of what we're thinking, like this, this whimsy sports. And we were all just like, yes, that is it. Um, it's probably the, the piece of art in the club that I get asked about the most. I just love it. Uh, Miranda's going to include a chat, uh, link in the chat to, um, a TED talk that the, this photographer, Chris Burkhardt, gives about how he got into this concept of photographing snow surfing. Um, it's really interesting background on just how someone found their, like found their passion or their purpose. Um, and he talks about how it's just like this really life-giving experience to be cold and filled with adrenaline and surfing in these remote places with the best waves on earth. Um, so we have these, um, there's four, Miranda, if you wanna click through. The first two were taken, I believe, in Norway. Um, and I don't know sp the specific locations for where the other two were taken, um, but I have just always loved, we actually have them printed in color in the club. Um, they're black and white on the website, but um, I just have always loved this, the one of the guy using the piece of ice as a lounge chair. I just think it's great. Um, yeah, so Chris Burkhardt, highly high. If you're gonna do anything as a follow-up to this tour, watch his TED Talk, it's awesome. It's like 10 minutes. Um, How did you choose between what's gonna be color and what's gonna be black and white? You know, definitely the, the surf truck needed to be black and white. I think everyone felt that way. Um, and we just liked the idea of changing it up a little bit and bringing in a little bit of color. So we worked with um, Chris Burkhardt in his studio and they were able to provide color images. So it was just a way to like create some, some um, variation and um, comparison for, for different works. A lot of black and white. We had already had a lot of black and white. So we said, let's do a little color. Um, so now we're coming around the corner. This is my favorite part of the whole club, this lounge space. Um, I also happen to teach yoga here and I teach the Saturday morning class and like my favorite part of my whole week is when I arrive and I sit in the little lounge chairs and wait for my um, people taking my class to show up. I just love the space, watch the river, watch the runners go by. Um, it's so good. And so this is where we did our roller derby, roller, roller derby series, which is very difficult to see um, on my screen because of the glare, but you can obviously see it in the PowerPoint. So as we're going about this process, fortuitously, Michael Foreman happened to be reading one morning and he saw this article come up on the New York Times and it's um, just the New York Times, it's a, it's a present day article, current article, where they are just sort of like recapping the history of roller derby in the United States. And they included these great photographs that they took in the 1970s. And um, Michael was like, let's see if we can get them and do a little installation of roller derby. So I reached out to the New York Times, actually easier than I thought. You just have to, I mean, obviously have to buy them, but um, it's you know a, a service that they provide to their readers. And um, so we have this installation of roller derby photographs. I never knew like, how roller derby was invented or where it came from. It has an interesting background in my research. So it, it is like a post-depression era sport where kind of not dissimilar to maybe like this situation that we're all in right now, people were trying to figure out like how to get people out of their houses and doing things. And um, the guy who invented roller derby read some statistic that said that 90% of Americans had roller skates. So he invented this concept of roller derby and it had many iterations, didn't start um, the, the way that it ultimately ended up, ended up. It was more of just like a, almost like a marathon of roller skating. And then they introduced this idea of making it a full contact sport. And it has really deep, um, like feminist, like a really deep feminist foundation. Um, so another article that we're gonna put in the chat that I recommend checking out is um, learning a little bit about the history of roller derby. And it just seemed like perfect, like, of course, we have a yoga studio here, so let's put roller derby photos outside of it. <laughs> um, and then the last thing that we're going to talk about is the King Saladin mural um, that is on the wall in the main mezzanine space, kind of around the turf. And 
the cardio space. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. King Saladin is one of our artists in residence, and he actually had a, a, a piece, a work up an offsite that has sold since it was initially installed. But prior to even joining our group of artists in residence and offsite, he worked with um, the club to install that mural. Um, he is from West Philadelphia. He's a self-taught artist. Um, and he's a really interesting person. I've had the opportunity to meet him multiple times. Um, and I, you know, definitely very up and coming, going big places. So um, yeah, I don't know, is Alyssa still with us? She might have, oh, it looks like we lost her. She was, um, she's the EVP of marketing for Fiddler Club. She was with us there for a moment and she was the person who worked most closely with Saladin as he installed that mural, which I think is so additive to the space and creates so much, um, like it's just, creates like a sense of space and what would otherwise otherwise be like a big white box. Um, so yeah, so that's our tour of Fieldhouse Art. Any questions? Mine is more comment, but the, uh, the rollerblading series, one of the things I enjoy about it um, is like there's so many rich faces in that collection. Um, audience members, uh, derby players, I guess you call them. Um, but the intensity of everyone is everyone is fully engaged. Uh, you can see like people pulling at someone's face, uh, an, an arm, someone throwing an elbow. You can see the audience um, really being into it. Um, it's, it's probably my favorite series in the gym. Yeah, I mean, again, the New York Times article, I highly rec recommend reading it, just learning about the um, like the history of feminism and transgenders in sport and how there really is, there are no rules that are any different for women's roller derby than men's roller derby. Um, you know, so it's, and it's kind of like the, uh, like what has carried the sport through to, it still exists today, roller derby. What's the name of the artist from West Philly? King Saladin. I think I saw the, your yeah. video a few months ago. You had featured all the artwork in the Fiddler Club. He was yeah. featured, I think. Yes. Oh, sorry, my dog is freaking out all of a That's sudden. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Yes, um, Saladin is, is one of the featured artists in that video. Um, <laughs> he's just like this really positive person who is so like humble about his art. Um, like you would, you, you would almost like never know. Um, I had the chance to visit him in his studio and he just was like so warm and welcoming and, um, yeah, so I, I hope to see him go big places. Our artist in residence program, when we launched it in the fall of 2019, he, his work was the first work to sell from that collection. So, uh, we're hoping to get a replacement piece from him once we're back up and running and we'll have a new work of his hopefully in offsite soon. I just had a question. Do you have um, <coughs> rolling exhibits or do you just have this collection that you keep up? Fieldhouse is, is a permanent collection. I mean, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't ever maybe like change something out or move things around, but um, all of these works are either owned by Foreman Family Collection or Fittler Club. In the offsite space, we will change those works out they're all on loan from the artists, and we'll probably do that in the winter, spring of 2021, assuming everything goes, you know, according to plan. But yeah, yeah the idea was to have that installation up for somewhere in the vicinity of a year and a half, and we put it up in October, November of 2019. It's impressive what you've done, <laughs> really. Thank you. Thank it's you. Really, it's, it stands out when you go in the club, for sure. Yeah, I think, um, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I think another thing, doing things like this is important because the program, the art program at the club right now, like it was created on the fly and it's kind of confusing and we get that. So we try to get the message out to folks like how it all kind of breaks down because there are, and I didn't even mention this, but in the trophy room and the hotel, there's a whole series of Pamela Hansen fashion photographs which also permanent collection owned by Fiddler Club, um, mm -hmm. that if you haven't seen those, you absolutely must check them out. Black and white photographs taken in like their um, like outtakes from 1990s 
fashion shoots that she did for magazines like Vogue and Elle. Um, and they're just spectacular. They're perfect in for the vibe in our hotel rooms and the trophy room. Um, and I think we're going to have Pamela do a program in July. Cool. Stay tuned for that, a Zoom, a, a virtual, just where she talks a little bit about her works and um, <laughs> the, the pieces that we have on display. Thank you. It was great. Good. Thank you all for coming. Miranda and Al, thank you for your help putting this together. And thanks for supporting the Art of Fittler Club. More to come. So thank fun. You. Thank you so much. All right. Hope to see you all soon. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 <laughs> mm -hmm.